Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Beyond the Mexique Bay, a traveler's journal by Aldous Huxley. Dane reads. So this is the Penguin Books edition. As always, I'm going to read you the short blurb, then I'm going to check out my tabs. I didn't have too many for this, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So. Good travel books are scarce since they can be written only by exceptional travellers. Just as important as the material the traveller finds in the country he visits is the experience he takes with him. For this reason, Aldous Huxley, one of the most well-informed men of our time, was very suitably equipped to write a book of this kind. And Beyond the Mexique Bay, one of the foremost travel books of the 30s, is also one of Mr Huxley's most entertaining pieces of writing. Moreover, our growing awareness of the wonders of past Mexican civilizations and the widening appreciation of their artistic achievements makes this excursion to Guatemala and Mexico of even greater contemporary interest than it was when it was first published. So, let's go through, check out some tabs. So I thought it was interesting right off the bat he starts talking about overpopulation, which is definitely a thing. Although I don't know how accurate this was because again he wrote this um, you know, 1930 or whatever, where he says, In 1980, the population of the Western world will probably be somewhat smaller than it is at present. It will also, which is more significant, be differently constituted. The birth rate will have declined and the average age of death have risen. This means that there will be a considerable decrease in the number of children and young people, and a considerable increase in the numbers of the middle-aged and old. Little boys and girls will be relatively rare, but men, and especially women, since women tend to live longer than men, of 65 years old and upwards, will be correspondingly more plentiful, as plentiful as they are on a cruising liner in 1980. 1933. No, I don't know about that. And here, this sounds to me just like a 1930s rap battle. Uh, this was when he was in Trinidad, he said, The proceedings ended with a flighting. Three of the singers got up onto the stage together and proceeded to improvise stanzas of derision at one another's expense, attack and counterattack to the unspeakable pleasure of all the listeners. That's a rap battle. And here he's talking about race. And again, I, I don't think I necessarily agree with this. He says, uh, it is possible that there may be some small element of truth in this theory of racial determinism. Congenital differences in metabolism, nervous sensibility, and more doubtfully, intelligence, have been observed as characteristics of the members of different races. See, I, I agree that it's doubtful. Certain Melanesians, for example, seem to be, on the average, more sensitive to pain than we are. Bushmen, Australian blackfellows, and perhaps some races of Negroes are perhaps a little less bright in the head than Europeans and Asiatics. Definitely can't say that. But it must be remembered that over large areas of the Earth's surface, pure races are unknown. In Europe, for example, all talk about the congenital difference of one race from another, let alone its congenital superiority or inferiority, is perfectly irrelevant, for the simple reason that it is only in the remotest recesses and blind alleys of the continent that anything like a pure race can be discovered, and even here the purity of blood is certainly not untainted. Moreover, even when pure, the race is not biologically speaking a true race, but only one of several variations on a single racial theme, the European. Some cultures are, in certain respects, superior to others, but the explanation of the fact must be sought in the nature of the cultural tradition, not in the congenital differences between the races brought up within these diverse traditions. And here's again one of his rants. So this is why this book was kind of interesting, because it wasn't necessarily so much that it was a travel book, it was like a load of monologues about various things, so um, he says, The theorists of the left proclaim it almost as an axiom that, where there is private profit taking, there of necessity must also be periodical war. But this is clearly untrue. If capitalists were interested only in the efficient exploitation of their victims, as would to heaven they had had the sense to be, they would not waste their resources in fighting one another. They would combine to work out the most efficient scheme for squeezing profits out of the entire planet. That they do not do so, or do so only spasmodically and inadequately, is due to the fact that the exploiters are as much the slaves of the passions aroused by nationalism as the exploited. They own and use the instruments of propaganda, but are themselves the first to believe in and to act upon the nonsense they broadcast. These Machiavels are incapable of seeing their own best economic advantage. Peace, it is obvious, and internationalism pay. War on its present scale must, in the long run, inevitably harm the capitalists who bring it about. Nevertheless, they do bring it about and believe, under the patriotic can, that they are bringing it about in their own interests. They make war in order to increase the profits they derive from their particular system of nationalist economy, at the expense of the profits derived by fellow capitalists from rival systems. Nationalism is against the higher economic interests of the exploiters, but it creates certain particular interests of monopoly which to some extent justify the capitalists in their appeal to arms on business grounds. They also make and threaten wars on the Machiavellian principle that foreign dangers give the ruler an opportunity for strengthening his position at home. It is for this reason that all the post-war dictators have been scaremongers and sabre-rattlers. The fear of each people for its neighbours confirms the power of the rulers who happen to be in office. But what is this power compared with the power that would be wielded by an oligarchy of world rulers? 
and compared with the profits to be derived from a world system of economy, how poor are the profits earned under a mere nationalist system? Moreover, modern war is demonstrably ruinous to economic activity and disruptive of social order. So far from enriching and strengthening himself by war on the present scale, the capitalist ruler is likely to lose in the convulsion most of the money and power as he possesses. In spite of which, our rulers insist that the political and economic system shall remain, to their own manifest disadvantage, nationalistic. Safe and profitable, internationalism is yet rejected. Why? Because all capitalist rulers are bound by a theology of passion that prevents them from rationally calculating their profits and losses. And so long as such a theology continues to be accepted by rulers, it makes no difference whether these are private profit makers or bureaucrats representing the people. The development of nationalistic state socialism is not only possible, at the present moment it actually seems a probability. It's just interesting because again this was written before the outbreak of the Second World War. And he says, Universal education has created an immense class of what I may call the new stupid, hungering for certainty yet unable to find it in the traditional myths and their rationalisations. So urgent has been this need for certainty that in place of the dogmas of religion they have accepted, with what passionate gratitude, the pseudo-religious dogmas of nationalism. And he quotes uh, a poem, he says, uh, We may parody the words of the old song and ask, Will the hate that you're so rich and light a fire in the kitchen, and the little god of hate turn the spit, spit, spit? I just thought this was quite an interesting little passage from his time in Antigua, he says, I tried to do some painting in the woods behind the hotel, but soon gave up in despair. The hot sun and the insects were too much for me. Or was I perhaps merely using these ordinary plagues of the landscape painter as excuses for not prolonging the parade of my own incompetence? But there was no doubt about it. Here, at Antigua, I felt more than ordinary incompetent. The problem was fundamentally the same as that which had confronted and defeated me so often in Provence. How to render a brilliantly coloured landscape in equivalently brilliant tones without making the thing look like a railway company's advertisement of the Riviera. A number of contemporary Contemporary painters simply evade the difficulty. They ignore the brilliance in front of them and transpose the whole scene into a much lower and quieter key. Landscapes, which nature has daubed with the most gaudy strontium yellows, cadmium reds and cobalt violets, are rendered by them in terms of black, white and the earth colours. The result, I admit, is often very agreeable. But I resent the agreeableness, for it seems to me that a difficulty has been shirked. It is relatively easy, as I know by amateurish experience, to achieve a pleasant harmony when you are using a few quiet colours. But oh, how difficult it is to harmonise the many and brilliant tones which actually exist, maddening as it is to admit it, in external nature. I myself have never succeeded, which is why I stick to the easily manageable earths. But it irks me to have to make a virtue of incompetence, and from time to time I have yet another shot at rendering cadmium with cadmium and genuine sky blue with the appropriate cerulean. Always alas in vain. Putting away my painting things I cursed the insects and the sun, but when I looked again at what I had painted I secretly felt rather grateful to them. And the final little extract I want to read to you guys, which is again a little bit of what wouldn't pass in 2021, you know? He says, Indian men are often handsome, but I hardly ever saw a woman or a young girl who was not extremely ugly. Endemic goiter does not improve their native homeliness, and without exaggeration I should guess that at least a third of the women of Chidkashta Mango have bulging necks. One would expect to find cretins in a population so much afflicted with goiter, but I never saw a single one. Doubtless they are born but fail in the unmerciful environment of an Indian rancho to survive. Here he means Ameri Amerindian, American Indians. So obviously native, natives there. But yeah. Beyond the Mexique Bay, A Traveller's Journal by Aldous Huxley. I didn't find it as gripping or as interesting as his fiction, even though it does do kind of the same thing. Like this, there is bits of travel writing in this, but a lot of it is just him like sharing his point of view on various things, you know? So, I don't know. It's, it is obviously a traveller's journal rather than a travel writing book, because a lot of the time he's not actually talking about where he's travelling. And again, there are also just a few bits where it does feel very dated. Weirdly more from his uh, attitudes and like the societal attitudes, than like the actual historic stuff, like when he's talking about uh, the rise of the Nazis and stuff, bearing in mind, as I say, this was in the 30s before the Second World War. But overall, it was still pretty interesting. I gave it like a weakish 3.5 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of Beyond the Mexique Bay by Aldous Huxley. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.